You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes over bulldoze their villages, seize their property under the laws they had no part in making? Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 403 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. In the list for today's show, I have North Korea, Ukraine, and Yemen. So some of the more popular subjects that I talk about. So it's going to be one of those great shows to go to libertarianinstitute.org, find Foreign Policy Focus on the homepage and hit the share button, or just tell people, hey, there's this uh, podcast I like, and if you want to keep up on foreign policy, this is what you check out. Uh, That kind of thing helps the show to grow, and I really appreciate it. If you're a new listener to the show, uh, make sure you subscribe to it somewhere, uh, whatever your favorite podcatcher is. That way you don't miss an episode. I update current events on the show, and the way you get the most out of it is by listening uh, to as many episodes as possible. And last, if you want to donate to the show, you do that at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. There you will get access to uh, some of the bonus content that I put up over time. I'll be honest, there's not very much. There's a couple dozen episodes probably at this point. Uh, going forward, you get access to the monthly live stream. Donors get a chance to, you know, join me and chat with me either live or post questions that get preference uh, for the Q and A uh, that I do on the live stream. So again, that's uh, patreoncom slash focus. I know I really slapped off on September and had to throw something together at the last minute that didn't turn out too great. October, I already got scheduled for Tuesday the fifteenth at nine p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that way I'm going to be able to promote it for a couple weeks and everybody could, you know, do the little things in your schedule you want to to adjust it around. And that way, uh, hopefully a couple of you all could join me on the chat and really get, you know, the live stream and the patron bonus content there up to the quality it needs to be. All right. Starting off on today's show, talking about a couple changes that Twitter is making to the platform and uh, what's going on there. And Caitlin Johnstone is doing a great job of... Uh, covering it and i will link to an article in the show notes page of that so the two subjects that she covers uh the first one is this new twitter function that allows people to hide replies to their posts and so of course uh, you know the i'm sure the reason for this policy isn't to allow somebody like let's say uh matt's boot or a john bolton to kind of censor his dissenters replies on twitter but, you know, to keep people from having, like, penises posted in their replies. And, you know, that kind of thing is a problem and gross and, you know, obviously shouldn't happen. But, you know, the actual tool, the actual way this is going to be used again is by the John Bolton types who are going to use it to hide their criticism. Uh, and I believe John Stone uses a blue checkmark term. But generally, the people on Twitter who are, you know, they're representing the established positions uh, will now be able to kind of memory hold the the criticism of them if you look at the hide replies thing you actually have to scroll all the way down and then click on like another thing uh to get to see all of the replies and so i'm sure there's you know gonna be a lot of junk in there and it's gonna be a relatively unused function it'll be interesting to see what happens if somebody like president trump starts doing this and you know where you have a post that's gonna have forty thousand or so replies or, or something like that by donald trump and you know Half of them or 10% of them or, you know, maybe a smaller number in most cases are going to have really good reasons why, you know, the president's a liar. It's going to, you know, not be some mushy Twitter, oh, he's a puppet of Vladimir Putin crap. But, you know, some real like, actually, Donald Trump is going to sell Javelin missiles to the Ukrainian military that has absorbed white supremacist, you know, ethno-nationalist type factions within it like the Azov Battalion, and that's a real crime and a real problem. And, uh, you know, it, it made Donald Trump complicit in the war crimes that uh, end up being committed by the Ukrainian army and also, you know, creates more tensions and problems with Russia and Putin. And so, you know, condense all that into a tweet, um, you know, a, a well-thought-out, well-pointed one at President Trump, and that's something that's actually really good to have on Twitter And so that, you know, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking that is really going to be targeted with this hide replies and the real problem of it. And 
you know, Caitlin Johnstone excellently makes this point. She also points out that there is a Twitter executive. I guess he does some kind of editorial work for Twitter, uh, overseas, the Mid East, Africa, and Europe. And he is also a part of this British army. I think they're the 77th Brigade. And it's kind of like an official slash propaganda branch of the UK, I guess it's Ministry of Defense over there, you know, Ministry of War. And, you know, for an organization that's constantly in like all these other social media organizations running around saying, you know, oh my God, we got to stop propaganda, Russia propaganda, we got to ban people because of Russian bots. Well, here you have a case where you actually have someone who's, you know, working at a high up position at Twitter, so has influence in the company. And at the same time, is it, you know, an official propaganda artist for the British government? All right. Next up on Hong Kong, it looks like for the, I believe the first time in these months longer protests, a protester was shot by the Hong Kong police. I haven't talked about the Hong Kong protest in detail for a few weeks now. But, you know, during the time I haven't been talking, it seems to be coming more and more like these uh, groups you see in the U.S. like Antifa or, you know, some of these right wing groups as well that go around and have confrontations with other people. Uh, You know, they I have seen, you know, disturbing videos of people swinging around like padlocks on ropes and, you know, these people come out with shields and stuff like that. And so, again, um you know, while it does seem like the protesters are becoming, to say it politely, more reckless in Hong Kong or possibly, you know, looking to provoke somebody getting shot in order to further the U.S. anti-Beijing movement, you know, the truth is probably somewhere in between that still. And so, I, you know, I'm sure there's still legitimate people out there who really believe um, and, you know, to some extent, I'm sure they're right that Beijing is encroaching on Hong Kong autonomy and, you know, they want a more free open market, which, you know, isn't necessarily what the Hong Kong government is offering anyways, but you know, that that's, you know, what they have. And there's other people out there who are protesting because of, you know, Beijing plus the, you know, economics in Hong Kong, I think are really bad. Uh, there's so much crony corruption that goes on with the land. Um, you know, in that autonomous zone that I think prices are just so out of control uh, that it makes it difficult for, you know, a lot of young people to go and find housing, to have apartments, to, you know, just make a life. You can't you know, really start your life when you're still looking, living with your parents. So protesters are getting more, you know, reckless again, saying it kindly. Uh, and, you know, you if the video with these police is shot in very high quality where you could see that. There is a police officer there. The police officer, you know, in riot gear has a club or some kind of, you know, stick and uh, was at one point like fighting a little bit more with the protesters, gets backed up a little bit, pulls out the gun, takes a shot, hits the guy. I believe it's a guy at least in the right or left shoulder. Uh, there was some initial reporting that the person was likely to die or was in critical condition uh, from Later reporting, it sounds like the person was doing okay. Now, you know, who who knows? People, you know, get these bull wounds and, you know, something else starts bleeding and they end up dying. Uh, that's, you know, obviously still the cop killing that person and problematic. But at least for now, it looks like the person's going to survive, so that's good. I don't know what to say other than no clean hands here. You know, the, there's obviously a problem with uh, the Hong Kong police, you know, fi- constantly fighting these uh, battles with these rioters. The problem is, is that... Uh, you know, there's plenty of video footage that shows that, you know, especially these more Antifa looking, uh, protesters are running around out there and harassing other people and businesses as well. And so it's not like they're just peacefully assembling and the cops are coming in and beating the crap out of them. Uh, but, you know, the, I'm sure the cops are overreacting and, uh, using too much force as well. On Ukraine, the U.S. has approved the sale of 150 Javelin missiles to the Ukrainian government. As I already pointed out, the, the biggest problem with this, of course, is that after the 2014 coup in Ukraine, some of these white separatist neo-Nazi groups, uh, I've heard them referred to as Banderaites, uh, Stefan Bandera, who I guess was kind of a World War II era, very prominent Nazi in Ukraine, started an armed movement that, you know, obviously still exists to this day. So these people have very disturbing and very problematic points of views and, 
you know, they formed brigades and one of them was called the Azov Brigade. And eventually that's just more or less now become a part of the Ukrainian military fighting in the civil war uh, started by that 2014 coup. Again, separatists in the east of the country and they're backed by Russia. Now, because of the, you know, the Soviet Union and other things that have happened in history, uh, Ukraine has a pretty complicated legacy. Uh, being kind of the one of the meeting points and battlegrounds for the Soviets and the Germans during World War II, uh, you know, just soaked that land in blood. And, you know, that creates a whole bunch of lasting problems and issues in the region. Uh, so, again, you know, you end up with groups that have, you know, neo-Nazi factions. And then on the other side, you have people living in Ukraine. And uh, at least part of this is due to Soviet, like, kind of intentional population redistribution. Um, you know, very much identify with, the you know, their Russian ethnic backgrounds and <laughs> are extremely opposed to that kind of government. And also saw that the 2014 coup in Ukraine... And, and, you know, while you had these neo-Nazi elements, that's not who the U.S. government uh, was backing that coup for. And this is, again, the Obama government under Biden. And uh, from what I understand, Biden had a larger role in the whole, you know, Ukraine 2014 coup. And the reason, you know, with that was the Yanukovych government wasn't sufficiently pro, you know, U.S., pro-NATO, pro-EU, and was seen, you know, too much as, uh, wanting to get along better with Russia and form better ties with Russia. And so the, you know, the U.S. came in over through that government and put in uh, Peter Poroshenko, who ends up to turn out to be probably even more corrupt and a, a worse government. And uh, the, you know, the people in the east of the country who don't want to join NATO because, you know, again, they, they identify with their Ru- uh, Russian ethnic backgrounds. And, you know, being a part of NATO uh, because of NATO expansion and militarism has made Russia an enemy. And, you know, they don't want to be enemies with their, their homeland. That's, of course, right next door in this case. And all these things, you know, create this situation where you then have the Civil War breakout, 13,000 people dead. And it's really just hold together by, I, I guess, I used to say loose ceasefire agreement because there's pretty frequent violations of it. But at the same time, the battle lines never really have changed in the past few years. And so I guess, you know, in that way, the ceasefire agreement has been pretty successful and, you know, preventing any kind of larger war from breaking out. So there's, you know, I guess so many avenues I, I could go from here to talk about how Trump has somewhat shockingly, somewhat predictable, gone along with the Obama policy in Ukraine, even though it's unnecessarily confrontational with Russia. So you think it should throw out the whole Trump is a puppet of Vladimir Putin argument pretty quickly. But no, uh, because you know, the U.S. policy is to support the Ukrainian government. Donald Trump doesn't stop doing it. He does it more. Yeah, Obama was actually resistant to giving uh, lethal aid to Ukraine, and the Trump administration went ahead and did that. You know, of course, then, because of the, the coup and the shakeup in Ukraine, uh, there is corruption and money flowing all over the place, and the son of the vice president, I guess, seemed like probably a pretty good mark to get somebody within your company to influence the U.S. and maybe get some favorable contracts or uh, favorable laws passed. And, you know, that's how I'm in my, in my speculation, uh, Hunter Biden, uh, you know, the, the failed ex-military son of the vice president, uh, ends up on the board of a Ukrainian gas company when he knows about nothing about Ukraine or gas. And then, of course, when the prosecutor was going after that company, uh, suddenly Joe Biden decides to fire that prosecutor. And, you know, Joe Biden will insist that's because the prosecutor was corrupt and the prosecutor was corrupt. But at the same time, it could have been because that prosecutor was targeting a company that, uh, his son was getting some corrupt money from. But, you know, th- these kind of things, I think, should put nails in the U, uh, excuse me, the Russiagate coffin, right? That Trump, uh, you know, is giving these, are selling, excuse me, these Javelin missiles, 150 of them to the Ukrainian army, uh, selling them for $39 million. But no, you know, nobody seems to recognize that anymore. I guess they've kind of officially moved on to Ukraine Gate. And so rather than having Ukraine Gate be that, oh my God, Trump is backing this terrible government in Ukraine and look at all these problems it's creating with Russia. And oh my God, I can't believe it. White nationalist Donald Trump is supporting the Ukrainian military with, you know, kind of white separatist fashions. Isn't this the worst kind of thing that could possibly be happening? But no, it's all about 
oh, he had a call with Zelensky and tried to leverage something against them because of uh, Russiagate and being a Putin puppet. It's, it's all so stupid. Anyways, moving on to North Korea, where we have Pompeo and I read, I believe it, it was a Korean outlet, but I think it was South Korean, saying that they had sped some working level talks to happen within a week. October 5th is the only date I saw. So let's hope for that. I, I mean, it really needs to happen. We're running out of time here. Uh, Kim Jong-un said that, you know, he's only going to continue to enter in this loose freeze for freeze agreement that the U.S. had uh, in part set up by China and, of course, reinforced at the Singapore summit where the U.S. was going to stop uh, the war games with South Korea, which they really haven't. And North Korea was going to stop tests of its nuclear program, which they somewhat have. Well, I guess they have stopped tests of their nuclear program. They have continued tests uh, of other kinds of missiles. Um, so, you know, not in complete uh, compliance, I guess, with the spirit of the whole, uh, you know, Singapore summit and everything. Now, in some bad news, uh, you know, because it seems like good news. Hey, Pompeo saying those talks are going to happen. North Korea decided to test uh, some kind of missile, one, possibly two, and possibly a missile fired from a submarine. Now, I guess still, as long as it's not a nuclear capable missile, it's not in technical violation of the, you know, the agreement that North Korea has with the United States. But it really seems to me like the kind of thing that any kind of hawk in the administration and in the media is going to capitalize on to try to force Trump in on this position. Now, Trump should say, hey, look, I want them to stop feeling like they even have to test weapons. So I'm going to go over there tomorrow and shake hands with Kim Jong-un. And tell him that I really like him to give up as many of his newts as possible. But the American aggression is off. You know, we're done threatening you guys. Um, you know, what you do with your newts uh, is, is your decision. Hopefully you're not dumb enough to, you know, sit around and let them just, you know, accumulate dust and cost you money for the next few decades. And decide just to turn them over. And in that way, we'll, you know, even take off those sanctions just a little bit quicker for you or something a little bit like that. Um but, you know, that's not how the, the president will respond, even if he doesn't, you know, call off talks or something like that. I, I think he's likely to say, oh, well, they really shouldn't have done that and wake his finger a little bit. And that, you know, I think just hurts the whole atmosphere going into talks. Another thing going on uh, with and around North Korea is that over the past two to three weeks, there's been at least three incidents between North Korean fishing vessels and Russia. Russia accusing the North Koreans of poaching, so I assume that means they're entering what Russia claims to be their territorial waters, and as you'll hear in a minute, the territorial waters are around the Korean Peninsula, I think, are claimed by a lot of various different countries under various different treaties and called different things, and so it makes it all really complicated. Um, but anyways, Russia is saying that these North Korean fishing boats are entering their water. They've arrested well over a 100 people in these three incidents. One, the second one actually ended up after one vessel was seized, another vessel opened fire on the Russian ship, and one person on the North Korean fishing ship was shot and killed. This last time, 11 vessels were seized with, with over 80 people. My guess is there's a lot of things that could be going on here. Kore North Koreans are desperately starving and, uh, you know, just willing to do something dangerous like cross into Russian territorial waters to hope to, you know, get fish and get out without you know being seized i guess it's possible that maybe they're trying to get captured as a way to you know get to russia um uh, but the reason i doubt this is i guess the russian ship was going to seize uh the the second ship on, on the second encounter and that's when they opened fire so that seems to me like they're trying to prevent being seized another possibility is is that maybe uh, uh, Russia's being a little bit more aggressive here and uh, not letting the North Koreans fish in waters that they have in the past or, or something like that. And then in other news on, on the Korean Peninsula, that South Korea carried out a air patrol around an island that is also claimed by Japan. So you have a whole bunch of islands kind of off the, the coast of the Korean Peninsula and various countries claim them. Uh, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and Russia. And, and these are all kind of conflicting claims. Some of them are bigger deals than others. I, I think the one between Russia and Japan is pretty significant. Um, but, you know, this again is just another issue between South Korea and Japan that I'm sure really complicates things for the United States. 
uh, you know, looking to have strength in the Pacific Ocean, I, I would assume would mean, you know, making these two allies get along. And right now they're not sharing intelligence. And, you know, I'm sure all, pretty much all the weapons in these two countries are, or a lot of them are American made, maybe not even most, but uh, a large number of them are American made. So this was a uh, F-15K variant that the South Koreans were flying over this island. And <laughs> it'd be funny, you know, if Japan would take one of their f 35s to chase it away but i think that is you know kind of just show the ridiculous nature of the world under the u.s empire at this point where our allies using our weapons are can't say fighting each other with them yet but certainly in conflict with each other and we see this other places as well uh like northeastern syria all right some important stuff on afghanistan pakistan is trying to revive talks between the u.s and the taliban I guess they hosted Zalmay Khalilzad this week. And then the leadership of the Taliban peace negotiation team was also supposed to be in Pakistan this week. I couldn't get confirmation that the, these two sides were actually going to talk. But the fact that they're both meeting in, you know, with Pakistani officials in Pakistan the same week, uh, you know, maybe there, there's a, a little shine of light there. I'll, I'll definitely keep posting on that. The Afghan elections happened last Sunday. Uh, there's not, even a, a pretense that there's going to be a winner declared likely until November. Uh, the way the Afghan elections work is a whole bunch of candidates enter, and then they have one round of voting. And if nobody gets 50%, they have another round of voting. Honestly, I think that's just one way to go to show that this probably isn't going to work, that you have a country that really doesn't understand elections or democracy, and then you're going to have an election process where there's potentially... You know, two presidential votes cast, uh, you know, when in, in Michael Hastings book, he points out that, you know, the people of Kandahar don't even understand why they need to have another election. In the past, these elections have been a magnet for violence. This most recent election, luckily, doesn't seem to have been quite as bad as some of the ones in the past. Uh, so that was good news. Maybe part of the reason why is apparently voter turnout was way down. And I won't put an asterisk on that because Voter fraud has been rampant in Afghanistan. And so maybe this is a situation like with the ghost soldier problem that that whatever biometrics are going on uh, in the Afghan polling centers, they've improved enough that just about the same number of people are voting. It's just less people voted twice or, or fraudulently voted or ballot boxes were stuffed. Anyways, they're saying like 2.2 million. Uh, this is a, a tiny fraction of the country. Both people, uh, both the front runners claimed victory, full out victory, you know, a 50% majority. Uh, that is the current president, Ghani, and then a former, I believe, executive in his administration, uh, Abdullah. And so, the, you know, they both declared victory. Honestly, you know, the election's a joke. Um, you, you know, there's no real idea that this is the will of the Afghan people to have whatever uh, one of these two people uh, foisted upon, you know, uh, 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 thrown in Kabul, where you really don't even rule the rest of the country anyway. I mean, Pashtunistan is Pashtunistan. It's ruled by the Taliban, except for, you know, maybe a few population centers in some of these cities. But for the most part, you know, the Pashtuns had their territory, and they rule it, especially, you know, during the night. And the elections are just some... Uh, stupid trade that the Americans continue to force on the Afghan people because we don't understand Afghanistan and we can't give them a uh, government and a democracy. Another thing that happened in this election that was, it's just more proof that, you know, this concept is never going to work in Afghanistan. And that is, you know, Afghan women rights groups were coming out and saying, hey, look, you're having all these biometric data that goes in, you know, the, these voting booths. It's going to expose women too much and make it too dangerous for them to vote. So they're not even going to want to vote. So the idea of having, you know, a verifiably fair election means that women are too afraid to vote and therefore don't vote and undermine you know, the idea of democracy. Or you have elections that are so fraudulent that undermines the idea of democracy. I mean, this is <laughs> this is the question to have uh, when it comes to Afghanistan and voting. And, you know, it, it just goes to show it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. All right. Yemen news. So I want to talk, and I talked about this on the live stream for those of you who hung around and heard that, uh, you know, probably just hear a lot more of the same here. But the attack that happened where uh, it's reported by the Houthis that they captured a few thousand uh, Saudi soldiers, I I'm going to get into all that now. 
So Nasser Arby did an interview with Scott Horton, and that'll be linked on the show notes page. Absolutely fantastic. And of course, you know, everybody should be listening to Scott's show. And if you've already gone to the Libertarian Institute, you know, that's Scott's Institute. So you're going to find the Scott Horton show there above the, the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. But in that interview, Scott really goes over all the details of this with Nasser. So in the past on the show, I, I talked about the attack a little bit and just say I had some skepticism of the Houthi story. I think it turns out to be more true than not. So uh, let's get into it here. Nasser says the attack didn't happen, you know, within the past few days, but past few weeks. Uh, so when the story first came out, I think it was kind of reported and people felt like it had just happened. It was like Operation Victory from God or something like that. Uh, it actually happened a few weeks ago. When I had first talked about it, I said that, you know, the claim that they captured 2,000 Saudis. Uh, seemed quite outlandish to me, and I thought that this was probably, you know, a lot of mercenaries and Yemenis. Uh, that turns out to be the case. Uh, Nasser says lots of Yemenis, lots of Sudanese, but he, you know, kind of s- says that it may have been over 2,000, not under 2,000. And, you know, so these were, you know, a- as he points out, and I, I think this was a important point that he made that I should get into, that these were people paid by the Saudis to fight in Yemen. This wasn't the Yemeni army, you know, of the Yemeni people fighting against the Houthi rebels. And Scott Horton recently made a, a good point that, you know, these people really aren't the rebels anymore. They've ruled the capital city of the country for four years, five years. And this is just, you know, a mercenary force of desperately poor men willing to fight uh, for some Saudi blood money. Of course, you know, because they're mercenaries, I guess they're not very willing to fight and seem to surrender relatively quickly in this whole conflict. It, it sounds to me like what happened was is that it was actually some Saudi bombing that killed an awful lot of these people trying to surrender. Uh, so that would be awfully dark. But I've also seen it reported as who the drones actually carried out part of the attack and killed around 500 people. Overall, it looks like about 30 Saudis uh, or a little bit more were captured in this operation. Uh, so definitely not, uh, you know, an, a big capture of Saudi soldiers. And again, Saudi doesn't have very many soldiers. I've also seen people report that these were Pakistanis that were captured. I don't know if, if that's actually correct. And I mean, I've talked about in the past on the show that I know Pakistanis are the force that the Saudis, you know, I guess just by pretty much paying off the Pakistani government, they send a couple brigades over to defend uh, Saudi southern border. And so I do know they operate there, but I'm not sure that, you know, this was actually that Pakistani deployment. I think this was a, you know, Saudi paid mercenary force mostly. I think this possibly happened before the September 14th attack on the Saudi oil facility. And so I'm not sure how much, if any, uh, you know, the the news of this being reported is going to change things or or the way Saudis are doing things uh, prior to what already been the case post, uh, you know, attack on the oil facility since I, I think this event happened before. I guess one interesting perspective, you know, will kind of be at any point here, do the Saudi people start to kind of rise up and say, hell no, no more of this, uh, whether it's, you know, the, the people largely gain together for popular protests uh, or versus just other members of the royal family, maybe pulling off a coup against Mohammed bin Salman this time uh, rather than him pulling a, a coup on his uh, cousins and nephews and uncles or whatever and kind of just taking him out of power and saying that, uh, you know, you've had your chance, but you're obviously crazy. You're an idiot. You're costing us too much money. We're done with you. All right. Well, that's where I'm done with the show for today. ForeignPolicyFocus.LIBSYN.com, LibertarianInstitute.org, K-Y-A-A-A-L-E on Twitter. Foreign Policy Focus is the name of the Facebook group. Foreign Policy Focus is on Patreon. Uh, donate five bucks a month to get in on the live stream there. And thank everybody so much for tuning into the show.